The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101. We're so happy you joined us this week. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's your host, Susan Bartlestone. Back in October of 2009, a top aide to the governor of New York State, which is the state that I live in, was accused of ripping off his girlfriend's clothes violently choking her and throwing her against a bureau. And what criminal charges were filed against him? No criminal charges were filed against him. Why? Because under current New York State law, non-lethal strangulation or choking someone can be considered harassment, a low-level violation that's not even a misdemeanor, not a felony like assault. Now, I, at the hearing about this, I and a number of domestic violence groups and women's groups are absolutely shocked to find out that two things. Number one, that strangulation is extremely common in domestic violence cases. And two, that this failure to arrest for choking is not uncommon in many other states, many other states in addition to New York State. Now, a bill has been in- introduced into the state legislature here, which is aimed at upping the bar here, treating strangulation as the crime that it is. And I am honored to be talking about this bill and this problem with the crusading Brooklyn District Attorney Charles Hines and Warren County District Attorney Kathleen Hogan, who are both strong supporters of this bill. Then in the second half of the show, I'm going to discuss some fairly simple techniques that are effective if you're being choked. And I'm going to be talking with my buddy, self-defense instructor Joanne Factor, who was named top butt kicker of Seattle, Washington, and you'll find out why when we speak with her. Our Crime Stopper segment is back this week, and I'll be talking with Detective Michael Martinez, who's a woman, by the way, and she's from the Albuquerque Metro Crime Stoppers, and maybe we can help them catch a criminal. Well, you know what? I'm Susan Bartlestone. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101, and it's hot, hot, hot here in New York City. Perfect weather for discussing this hot, hot topic, and I know this is going to be a very interesting show. So let's get started right away with our true crime report. And this week I'm featuring Stacey Dittrich, former police officer and one half of the Justice Interrupted radio show and crusading website. And Stacy was on a uh, prior show with me. Uh, We were talking about bullying on that show. Well, I found out that she's also the author of a highly praised uh, detective series. This is a fictional series featuring Detective Cece Gallagher. And she also wrote a true crime book called Murder Behind the Badge, True Stories of Cops Who Kill. Stacy, welcome back to Crime Prevention 101. Well, thank you very much, Susan. I'm glad to be back. Oh, my pleasure. Now, let's talk about murder behind the badge. No one who respects the police like I do wants to hear that there are cops who kill. Right. Well, uh, that put me in a very precarious situation in writing that book, if you can imagine. Um, I, I'm asked frequently what my fellow officers uh, think about that book, and, and it's, it's a no-brainer. You know, no one wants to work with someone that is capable of viciously taking the life of another. We're not talking about line-of-duty deaths here. Um, I took 18 cases of the most horrific stories you can imagine. We're talking serial killers, um, mass murderers, uh, just very horrific crimes committed by police officers uh, throughout the country. Of course, I have featured in there um, the illustrious, uh, 
charismatic soul himself, Drew Peterson, who is coming up for trial, I believe, in June. Uh, I also featured the case of Bobby Cutts, Canton, Ohio, police officer who subsequently uh, murdered his pregnant girlfriend, Jesse Davis, which was also a very high-profile case. And it actually ends with one of the worst of the worst, which was Ger- Gerard Schaefer, uh, one of Florida's first serial killers, known serial killers, uh, back in the 70s, uh, murdered, um, they're estimating, up to 40 women. And a lot of those was when he was working as a police officer and def- deputy sheriff. And actually, there's there's no race or gender in this book, Untouched. I have female officers in there, uh, mm. including Antoinette Frank from the New Orleans Police Department, who was a mass murderer on duty, uh, murdered two Vietnamese restaurant workers, murdered her own partner, and also murdered her own father. And this was all while wearing her uniform. Oh, God. You know, it... I guess there's, there's, is there any way to screen out? I mean, you start well, to hear that's, that. That's, it was very interesting to me because, you know, um, being in, in law enforcement, I had conducted numerous background checks. I had to do background checks for incoming um, corrections officers and, and police officers, and it's a very lengthy and tedious process, and it's one that you can easily want to overlook things, but um, you can't do that. And one thing I saw with all of these officers across the board was that huge, huge red flags uh, were raised during their background investigations um, that were so blatant that any um, competent background investigator or administrator, police administrator, would have said, oh, stop, just a minute here, we're not hiring this person. These are people that these personalities and, and these traits in them were not a product of being a police officer. They were already there prior to becoming police officers. So, and the bottom line saying, is they should have never been hired. Uh, you said, so this was like, this was, uh, you know, error? Just, this was police error? No, I actually I have, um, I, I even, it's interesting, I go back to the very first police officer uh, ever executed for murder, and that was in 1912, Charles Becker in New York City, the New York City police lieutenant. Uh, mm. he was a little before my murder. time, I don't think ever. What's that? It's a little before my time. <laughs> yeah, no, but I go, I go all the way back and, you know, all the way up to the present. So, again, you know, even back with Charles Becker in 1912, there were things uh, that he had done prior to being a police officer, and that, of course, was the time of Tammany Hall and, you know, all that good stuff going on in New York City. So things, lots of things yeah. got overlooked. That's, but the the yeah, signs were there. Weird. And when they hired him, they were aware that the signs were there. And, you know, they they didn't do anything about it. And, and that's where I, you know, when I talk about this, I, I tell law enforcement agencies, you know, it may not seem like anything to you now, but boy, oh, boy, Put a badge and a gun in this person's hand, and it's, yeah. it's gonna explode. So you and, need to be you know, extremely there's, careful. There's also problems with corruption. And, you know, forget you know murdering, but there's corruption. There are, there's always charges of brutality when you when you I guess you don't screen out the, or screen for. Uh, those I don't know if you can. Can you? Can you? Well, you know, of course. I mean, I mean you talk of, you know, when, well, you know, when you're animals, a background you investigation, know? you go, you you go through this person's life with a fine tooth comb, and you know, I've had to do that. I've talked to friends and former coworkers, uh, ex girlfriends, which are a great resource, and ex boyfriends. I mean, if these people are saying, yeah, the guy's got a drinking problem, or he whacked me around a couple times, but he was never charged. The cops were never called. Well, there's a propensity for violence there that you might want to just take a step back and look at. And again, you know, the biggest things that a lot of these people displayed prior to becoming police officers were uh, financial problems. Promiscuity, promiscuity was a huge, huge factor. Mm. Um, incidents of violence, incidents of deception. Um, but when you look at the totality of all of those and put them all together, you would it would just you would look at this person and say, no, it's we shouldn't hire them, but they were hired. 
Well, I guess I mean, Antoinette she... Frank, for crying out loud, she falsified a letter of recommendation from the mayor of New Orleans. They wow. never double checked it. <laughs> okay, and... you know, I hope uh, you should send this book to every police. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know. Oh it's, it's crazy. But, you know, um, yeah, it was pretty compelling. I personally was not aware of some of these people before, you know, I started the book. Yeah, certainly not that kind of thing. No. So let's do a, let's do a quick change of pace. Talk about the CC Gallagher series. Now, how many of how many books in that one so far? Well, so far I've written five. Three have come out. The fourth is due out this October, and I have to say those are my babies. <laughs> uh. If I could. Uh, Stick strictly to those. I will be one happy Chiquita. I was um, just, uh, she's a very, very tough, tough detective, uh, kind of a train wreck in her personal life, but I have so much fun writing those, and I'm really excited. Um, I was just in Los Angeles uh, two weeks ago, and, and we're just doing the final negotiations of the contract. Um, the uh, Fremantle Media, along with Porchlight Entertainment. Fremantle, of course, does American Idol, and they did Baywatch. Uh, they're mm. optioning the books uh, to oh. produce into a television series. So I'm, I'm really, yeah. really excited that this really comes into fruition. I know there's a lot of steps and, of course, networks and a lot of uh, hurdles to jump, but just to get this whole process going of actually maybe seeing this on TV, I'm really excited about. Okay, this is fabulous. Yeah. 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 Who do you who do you see as Cece? You know, when we had our meeting, they had already compiled a list of actresses, and actually, I don't watch much television, so I wasn't really familiar with a lot of them. Um, you know, it's a good. Have you read the books? No, I have not, and you better do something. All right, we're gonna have to work on that. Um, right. No, you know, I just, I, it, it's really hard for me. Um, because I get, I, I, you know, I write, I write the characters and I have my own vision in my head and I guess it's really hard for me to put a living, breathing face on that face, if that makes sense. Um, you know, we've talked the names around, but from your, what's that? Right? She, she's got to come somewhat from your personal experiences, right? I mean, oh, sure. A lot of the books are, are based on actual investigations that I actually worked. Cece's. Uh, family is based on mine. You know, she comes from a family of cops, and of course, the books take place in the area that I worked at. And but that's kind of as far as it goes. She's her own uh, gun-toting cowgirl, I guess, and and does her own thing. But um, I think you know, she's an amazing character. Her coworkers are amazing characters, and I just. Um, really like the fact that I was able to bring actual experience to fiction. I, I'm a huge reader and police procedurals and thrillers, and this is kind of a romantic suspense um, well, series because there's a subplot there of all kinds of funky stuff going on. And <laughs> sounds <laughs> but, amazing. You know, I, I was able I, to bring – well, actually, you know, when I read those books, there's always that realism missing to me. Um, you know, I've mm-hmm. been in law enforcement, and I think, gosh, they don't talk like that. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't do that, and they don't act like that. And I was able to really put the realism, I think, into these novels. So I'm really excited about uh, it. I can't wait to read it. And uh, when when you're getting ready to release, come back on the show again. We'll we'll have oh, you back. Absolutely, and talk the rest absolutely. Of no, the the next one is the Rapture of Omega, uh, where she takes on an apocalyptic doomsday cult. So that was a, a whole different twist for me, as far okay. as the storyline on that. Sounds and that'll be out in this October. Stacy, give out your website so people it's, can find more information. Okay, it's Stacy Dietrich, and it's S T A C Y D I T T R I C H dot com. Stacy Dietrich dot com. I'm going to also link to it on my Crime Prevention 101 blog. Great. So people will be able to find you. And thank you so much for being with me once again today. We're going to talk again real soon. Great. Well, thank you, Susan, and uh, get out of that heat there and get into some. I'm trying. I'm trying. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. We'll talk soon. All right. All right well, bye-bye. This is, this is Crime Prevention 101, the radio show with an optimistic perspective on a sober subject. When we come back, how can it be that you can choke someone into unconsciousness and not even be arrested? We're going to find out. News. Opinion. Your voice counts. Call toll-free 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, how to respond to danger in 20 seconds or less. Check out www.crimeprevention.com. Prevention101.com for more information. Do you need directions to solid financial future? If so, the Money Answers Show with Jordan Goodman will provide you with a roadmap to making smart money decisions in every area of your personal finances. Join Jordan every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 3 p.m. Eastern for the Money Answers Show on the Voice America Business Channel. Learn how and where to get the best deals on mortgages, cars, and insurance. Find out the best ways to save for college and retirement. Get out of debt, improve your credit rating, and save on your taxes. The Money Answers Show with Jordan Goodman will provide you with great tips on investment opportunities in real estate, stocks, annuities, and other investment vehicles. That's the Money Answers Show with Jordan Goodman on the Voice America Business Channel every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The Marsh Engel Show. Join the movement to empower yourself with the essentials of feminine power and success and learn how women around the world are becoming more inspired, more influential, and absolutely amazing. Each week, Marsh sits down for an engaging conversation with women who are boldly committed to living their most amazing life. You'll discover ways to step into your greatest vision, deepen your relationships, and unleash your real creative brilliance. Get ready. It's time to jump into the conversation. That it's Monday afternoons at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern for the Marsh Engel Show on the Voice America Business Network. Have questions about wind power? Listen for the TLG Wind Power Hour with Terry from TLG Wind Power Products. He'll cover the ins and outs of wind energy with you, whether you're a do-it-yourselfer or want a ready-made product. Let Terry give you the know-how and understanding of making wind energy work for you. Terry will share decades of hands-on experience so that you don't have to learn about wind power the hard way. The TLG Wind Power Hour, live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Green Talk Network. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Susan would like to remind you that no absolutes exist in a crime scenario and no advice can possibly address every variable. Each situation should be evaluated individually and responded to in a way you instinctively judge best. It's Susan's aim on this show to provide you with the information and options that will help you make that instinctive assessment quickly and safely. And if you're already a survivor of the kind of crime we're talking about on the show today, or any other crime for that matter, please remember that there are no right or wrong responses in a criminal encounter and nothing that happened to you was your fault even if you think you used bad judgment in a situation and left yourself vulnerable that's never an excuse for a crime or for violence so please call yourself a survivor not a victim and understand that with time distance and the proper professional help you can put what happened into perspective and get on with your life if you'd like to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, send your comments to solutions at fightsafe.com, and Susan may address some of them on future shows. That email address again, solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101. Hi, Susan Bartlestone here, and there is 
plenty of show left to tune in for, so please start tweeting about us. And don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook. I have over 4,000 friends now, and I'd love to have you join the party, too. Uh, I also want to remind you that June is Burglary Prevention Month, so please look for some easy burglary prevention techniques on my Crime Prevention 101 blog. Now, I, want, I can't wait to introduce you to my next guest. As I mentioned earlier in the show, the topic of the minimal penalties for choking or strangulation, particularly in a domestic violence case, has had a big, bright spotlight put on it because of a high-profile case here in New York City involving the office of the governor of the state. And this is a national issue. Uh, And a number of states have already passed statutes that will increase the penalty for this, this crime. Now, both of my upcoming guests are strongly advocating for the strangulation statute that's presently before the New York State Legislature. So I can't wait to introduce you to them. Uh, Charles Hines is currently serving his fifth term as DA of Kings County. Sixth. And that's Brooklyn for you non-New Yorkers. Sixth, that's sixth. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we actually hope he's going to break Morgenthau's record. Oh, I, I intend to. <laughs> <laughs> Our previous district, New Manhattan District Attorney, uh, just retired at the age of 92, and I hope that uh, Mr. Hines will, continue, will consider that very strongly. Right. I'm His a child tenure... compared to Morgan, though. I'm sorry? I said I'm a child compared to Morgan, though. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we want you here for a long and healthy li- uh, tenure here. Uh, and his tenure has been characterized by many innovative and pioneering criminal justice uh, strategies, particularly concerning domestic violence. For example, he opened one of the first, he opened the first family justice center in New York State, which, which uh, happens to be one of the most important innovations in the prosecution and handling of domestic violence cases, uh, domestic violence cases in the entire 20th century. And this center is dedicated to the memory of Mr. Hines' mother, Regina Catherine Drew, about whom the DA recently stated, as the surviving child of the nightmare of domestic violence, I've spent two decades trying to make sure that no woman suffered the way my mother did and no child has to endure the frustration and helplessness, helplessness I had while watching my mother regularly beaten, choked, and verbally abused by my father. So you know where his heart lies and his dedication lies. Hello again, Mr. Hines. Yes. And also with me tonight is Kathleen Hogan, Kate as we're calling her, and she has been the Warren County District Attorney since 2001 and was the first woman elected to that position. And among her many initiatives, uh, she helped established a grassroots network called Communities That Care. She created a child advocacy center. She received the Spirit of Justice Award from the U.S. Attorney's Office. She also serves in the prestigious post of president of the New York State District Attorney's Association. And coincidentally, her first job out of law school was as an ADA in Brooklyn under D.A. Hines. So welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me, Susan. And it's a privilege to be on with Joe Hines. Everything you said about his innovation and his leadership is absolutely true. I'm truly, you know, I would say he's one of my heroes as well. So, Mr. Hines, let's start with you then. How prevalent is the crime of choking in your experience, especially in domestic violence cases? I mean, what kind of a problem are we talking about? It is almost always present because, you know, domestic violence, um, which... Up until really about 25 years ago, it was just something that was never checked. Um, you know, it was something that people didn't want to talk about. And, and uh, the watching it develop, as I did, from yelling and, and harassment to slapping and to choking and then to uh, hard punching, you know that there's an evolution, and it's all about domination. And, and certainly strangling is part of that. And that's why it was so very, very important that under the leadership of Kate Hogan and because of the interest that by State uh, Senator Eric Schneiderman, we are going to at long last close another loophole to protect 
victims of domestic violence and their surviving children. Absolutely. And, you know, I, and I've heard that strangulation has been identified as, as one of the most lethal forms of domestic abuse, which is, which is why it's, it's just crazy to think that this could uh, be less than a misdemeanor. Well, as you know, as just Kate, Kate pointed out uh, at the press conference uh, in support of this, uh, it has up until this time been harassment, which the maximum penalty is mm-hmm. 15 days. It's absurd. But, you know, it, again, as I mentioned to you privately, New York is now one of the leaders in domestic violence across this country. Uh, why we continue to have this anomaly of, of not having strangulation considered a serious crime is something that None of us in this business really understood, but thank God that uh, time is yeah. changing. And I think it has a lot to do with the uh, the case involving uh, former Senator Hiram Matsurat. And I think that was a motivating factor for uh, the legislators to start <clears throat> pushing for serious penalties for strangulation. No, that's right. This is the second case involving high-profile people. So I guess it's about time we got on the sick. So, Kate, let me let me ask you this: What talk about this bill? What are we? What is this statute, and and what can we expect from it? Well, the, um, it's the Senate bill has been on its third reading in the Senate and the third reading in the Assembly, which means that it's very close to coming to the floor. And there's three provisions within this bill. The first creates a Class A misdemeanor for criminal obstruction of breathing. Um, now, as Joe had alluded, right now, if if a woman is in, in um, a violent struggle and the batterer is choking her, she can start losing her vision. She can feel like she's going to die. And yet, when 911 is called and the police respond, if there is not evidence of physical injury, the only thing we have is a harassment, which is not even a crime, and the maximum punishment is 15 days. Under this statute, that same conduct would be punishable by up to one year. Uh, the strangulation in the second degree is the act of the criminal obstruction of breathing, and you cause a loss of consciousness or stupor. That would be a Class D violent felony, and the maximum exposure on that is seven years. And then uh, strangulation in the first degree would be the same physical conduct, but that you would cause serious physical injury. Um, so it's obviously a huge uh, improvement for both uh, police and prosecutors because there's a widespread frustration from our perspective that when a batterer um, commits a crime of strangulation, the most we can do is file a charge of harassment and at best get 15 days in jail. And wasn't one of the problems there is that there's the tricky point was whether there was visible injuries or not, which is which is often there is not. Even if you strangle somebody into unconsciousness and then they they revive, there may not be physical injury, and that's what what the sticking point was, I think. That's exactly right. You need to have proof of physical injury, and it, contrary to what common sense says, under New York uh, penal law and the case law that follows. The physical injury isn't, a bruise doesn't constitute physical injury. Um, a scrape doesn't constitute physical injury. So you have to have more than um, the red finger marks on the neck. That certainly would prove the harassment, but it doesn't rise to what the law requires us to prove for physical injury under an assault third. You know, one of the things we deal with as prosecutors is a kind of denial. Uh, that there's still too many police agencies in the country that regard domestic violence as a nuisance. That, and it's particularly true in cases where the, the uh, women, and it's typically a woman, victim doesn't want to go forward. And there's a misunderstanding of uh, that attitude. You know, They don't really understand that uh, there are many reasons why she doesn't want to go forward. It might be fear of uh, further violence to herself or to her children or to her elderly family. It might be economic dependence. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, a self-evaluation um, uh, that maybe I'm not good enough for him. So all of those factors ordinarily uh, uh, kick in to, uh, to an investigating officer and maybe you know, to some assistant district attorneys. Or that's what it used to be anyway. And the, the attitude was, if she doesn't care, I don't care. 
So it's very, very important that, that, that we close this loophole so that there'll be a further understanding that strangulation is part and parcel of escalating domestic violence. No, absolutely. Now, I think that the law has gotten very good bipartisan support, actually. I think, that, I think the, um, the prognosis is really good on this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and does anyone have any idea about this, the assembly? Because it's got to go through both of the houses. I think we, we, we're doing well there, too, I think. Yes, it's on its third reading in both the assembly and the Senate, um, right. which, if history proves itself, means that it's uh, very likely to pass in short order. Well, that's wonderful, and I hope that New York State will serve as a, a model for those other states that haven't enacted this yet. Mm-hmm. Um, now, very quickly, either, either question to either one of you. What other laws do you think we need or other services for the victims of domestic violence? You've got a, about a well, minute. My, my, my complaint has been we don't have uh, a good definition of physical injury. And so if someone gets punched in, in, the, uh, in the eyebrow, and there's sutures uh, under the law currently. That's not enough physical injury to, to uh, support a charge of assault three. Now that has a devastating effect on victims of domestic violence. Now I know that Kate and, and I and a lot of other prosecutors pay no attention to that. So at the very least, we'll charge attempted assault, so it's not uh, minimized to a to a uh, harassment. But that has to be changed. The definition of physical injury. That's my complaint. It's a very high threshold. Uh, let me know if you want any help in this, because I'm, I'm ready to advocate for it. Well, you know, yeah. I, I wish you'd take time to, to come and see our Family Justice Center. You would be very, very impressed. We I would love to do that. You know, I had Casey Gwynn on the, on the show, and I'm extremely, uh, you know, impressed by, by the, the way this has grown, because it is the most innovative way of innovative method of handling these cases, and I'm just thrilled. Well, I hope you'll come and see it because it's. I will. I will definitely do that. Thank you so much. And, tremendous. And 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 thank you so much, both of you, for being on the show with me and and talking a little bit about this important topic. Well, thanks coming for up. Having thanks, Susan. My talk pleasure. To you soon, Kate. Coming up. Okay. What Bye, can you do? What can you do if you're being choked? Stay tuned and find out. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll free right now at 1 866 472 5787. 1 866 472 5787. That's it. That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. Dialogue is the single most powerful leadership tool we have to make a difference in the world. Leading conversations with host Cheryl Esposito creates a place for that dialogue. Tune into the Voice America Business Channel every Friday as Cheryl hosts new conversations among leaders from around the world in business, government, art, economics, and social change. We'll explore big ideas and everyday actions and learn how their own leadership has led them to discover a newfound sense of possibility in the world. Leading conversations with Cheryl Esposito, bringing big thinkers together in conversations that make a difference right here on the Voice America Business Channel every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention.com. Prevention101.com for more information. Are you ready to go green? You've asked, and we've heard you. Voice America presents the Green Talk Network. Environmental topics are at the forefront of our society, and the Green Talk Network is here to keep you up to date on the latest trends and new innovations for the eco-conscious lifestyle. We'll help promote a variety of ideas on the environment, from global warming issues to how you can become more eco-friendly in your daily activities. Be a part of the solution, not the problem. Visit the Green Talk Network page on voiceamerica.com and tune in. 
to help spread the green. This ain't your mama's brain and health show. Tune in and get ready for entertainment and information about your mind and body that will really change your life. Primal Body, Primal Mind Radio is a sane departure from conventional thinking about diet, health, and the brain. Host Nora Gedgaudis will also combine humor and science to illuminate the mind and open your eyes to the principles of neurofeedback and diet, which can help you and your family live a better life. Primal Body, Primal Mind Radio airs live Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello again, and thanks so much for joining me tonight. I want to remind you that June is also National Internet Safety Month, and you can get some really important Internet uh, safety information from the National Criminal Justice Reference Service, which is NC, like Charlie, J. John, or Robert, as sugar.gov, slash Internet Safety. And I'm going to post a link on my crime prevention blog. Now, before we uh, bring on my next guest, uh, Joanne Factor, and talk about what techniques can be used against choke and strangulation holds, just a few points that I want to make clear about self-defense, and that is this. First of all, there are a number of different techniques that Joanne and I are going to be talking about, but the best one to use in any particular scenario is probably going to be determined by the circumstances of the attack. In fact, it is going to be determined by the actual circumstances of the attack. Second, different self-defense and martial arts instructors favor different techniques. Joanne and I are going to present techniques that we've used and taught successfully and feel that are most successful. So these are ours that we've tested. Number three, in order to feel confident fighting back, you want to take a short-term course. Self-defense courses are four to six weeks. Joe and I are going to talk a little about that, too. And you've got to take it at least once a year. You know, the, the course you took back in college 20 years ago probably is not going to be much use to you now. Next one, no technique is infallible, no matter how much training you have, and we don't claim that on this show. Number five, don't take a self-defense course or martial arts training in order to cope with a bad or violent home situation. This is extremely dangerous. You've got to get out of the situation if it's that bad. And lastly, there are no right or wrong responses regarding fighting back during an attack. Only do what you feel is the safest, what you believe will save your life. Now let's meet my buddy, Joanne who's been studying self-defense and martial arts for more than 18 years and teaching almost that long. In 1994, she founded Strategic Living, which teaches self-defense to women and a variety of other populations that have special needs. The homeless, for example, people with physical challenges, she does such great work out there. This is her second appearance on Crime Prevention 101. So welcome back, Joanne. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be back again. My pleasure to talk to you again. Now, let's talk about strangulation, about choking. What's important to know about being choked? What's really important to know is a couple of things. First, it's pretty fast. You only have a few seconds, really, to respond, and you have to make that time count. Because you're Um, going to lose consciousness. Right. What is happening is that the attacker is either cutting off your windpipe and that's like not letting you get air into your lungs, or is cutting off the carotid arteries, which supplies Mm -hmm. blood to your brain. And And that'll make you pass out really fast. Yeah. I actually have heard that uh, 11 pounds of pressure for 10 seconds is the official uh, description of choking. And within that 10-second period of time, you're going to be unconscious, 
and if the windpipe is crushed, you could you could die. Mm-hmm. I've heard that also. I've heard that you'll even begin losing effectiveness after about three to five seconds. Mm-hmm. That's when you'll begin so you got, feeling some effects. You've got to think quickly, which is why, which is where training comes in. Absolutely, because the, right? Because the first instinct is to panic. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about a couple of things that we can do with techniques. And I just, in terms of techniques, now of course my my all time favorite stuff is the dirty fighting, using mm-hmm. common objects in the environment as weapons. For example, if you're in a place where you can where you can throw liquid into that person's eye or throw dirt if you're if you're pushed down to the ground and being choked on the ground, if you can grab something off of a table and smack that person in the head or blind them or take them off guard, you're going to be able to maybe get his fingers. And we're by the way we're right, we're assuming it's a male against female crime. Doesn't mm-hmm. have to be, but it's just easier, right? Mhm. All right, if you want to give yourself anything that you can do to, to take him off guard to try and get his fingers off your throat. So that's one thing. Let's talk about um, two hands from the front. And this is a typical kind of a choke, Joanne. Mm-hmm. What do we do? Yes, it is. And this is the kind of choke that you'll probably see more often in cases of domestic violence. Mm-hmm. And domestic violence is, is one of the major... Um, circumstances where you'll find yourself choked. So what do we do? Now, obviously, this is radio. So we're going to describe as best we can, but Joanne has put together a video of techniques, and um, this is on her website, strategicliving.org, so you're going to be able to see these techniques. So talk about what a simple thing that you teach against the front show, two hands from the front. Okay, a really, really simple one, and this is probably the simplest one I teach. If you can think of nothing else to do, just take one of your hands and just go right for their throat, go right for their face. So you're going for, you're trying for their throat to try to press their windpipe, or you're going for your fingers into their eyes and push, really push hard. And this works this is very effective. This is very effective if the person is pushing you against the wall while choking you. And it even works. I mean, I'm short. I'm barely five foot one. And I found this can work um, well for me on persons maybe up to six feet tall. And I've, I'm a little bit shorter than you. I'm five feet tall. And I have had difficulty with this, but mm-hmm. I was able to kick. I was able to kick a kneecap or shin. That's excellent. When I couldn't reach the the, the throat. Because especially most of the time their their arms are not, you know, straight out locked. They're kind of bent and they're kind of pulling you in. So it will bring the targets that you want to hit closer. And that's what you want to think of in terms of self-defense, targets to hit. Right. What I like to do is, teach students to go for very specific targets. I mean, if somebody's choking you, they're not testing your boundaries anymore. They're way past that. This is a very dangerous assault. And so I teach students to go for a target that will have an instant disabling effect. So I like eyeballs. I like throat. I like groin and kneecaps or the Mm -hmm. sides of the knee. If you can disable your assailant and you can escape, that's what your goal is. And now, another... Go ahead. There's a technique that I like for a front choke, and I've, and I've also used it from, for a back choke as well. And that is grab onto the person's hands, sling yourself forcefully down onto the ground, pulling him along with you mm-hmm. as a drop like a dead weight. Become a dead weight in his hands. And once you force him on, once he, once you pull him down, once you make him move over, you can pry his fingers because he's he's lost his balance and that's weakened his grip. And from the ground, there are a whole number of tech, of of targets that you can reach. His kneecap being one of them, and you can start kicking out, and you can you kind of follow him around. You kind of a little crab on your side and move around, and you can keep him at bay that way. 
Mm-hmm. That's excellent. If you can use That's... gravity, can really be your friend. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And this will also work. I've done it from behind as well. Now, there's one other um, quick technique. It's an, uh, kind of a triangle choke where he, puts your, he comes from behind and puts his arm over your throat. Right. And with that, one, that? for that, what I like to do is, um, and that's pretty scary for a lot of people because attacks from behind just generate that much more fear. You can grab onto the forearm and what you see in movies is people trying to tug it with their arms. That's not really mm-hmm. your strong point. Again, use gravity as your friend. Grab onto the arm and drop your weight while pulling on that arm. Exactly. Okay, that's going to loosen up the arm. Tuck your chin in really tight, and that will protect your windpipe. It will protect your carotid arteries. And then from there, keeping that chin tucked, just go for targets. Go for the Absolutely. eyes. Reach one arm back and find an eye, put your thumb in it. You can use your hand. You can karate chop into the groin. You can kick the shins. You can elbow into the solar plexus or the floating ribs. Whatever Mm -hmm. it takes to make that person let go. All right. And, again, here's where taking a little kind of training. Here's where a self-defense course is going to help teach you all of those things. And Now, Joanne, give out your website. Sure. My website is strategicliving.org, and the page you mentioned is going to be live by this evening, later this evening. Strategicliving.org slash choke releases. Yes. All right. Well, Joanne, thank you so much. Boy, this really flies. I know that... that, uh, we, we're trying to get through that there are things that you can do. Now, this is Crime Prevention 101, and my wonderful audience, stay right where you are. Coming up, I'll be talking with Detective Michael Martinez, who's a woman, by the way, and head of the Albuquerque Metro Crime Stoppers. Maybe we can help them catch a criminal. Thank you, Susan. My pleasure, Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. one 472 5787 That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, how to respond to danger in 20 seconds or less. Check out www.crime prevention101.com for more information are you a real sports fan get ready to talk football and anything else sports with Kwame Lasseter formerly with the Arizona Cardinals San Diego Chargers and St. Louis Rams Kwame's got the experience so he's prepared to talk sports with you every week on Kwame Lasseter's Sports Talk it's on the Voice America Sports Network every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time noon Eastern Time get ready for unpredictable fun and sometimes a sarcastic look at the world of sports that's Kwame Lasseter's Sports Talk on the Voice America Sports Network. You gotta believe. Listen up. Conceive Magazine is now on the air, live and on demand on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Hosted by Kim Hahn, founder of Conceive Magazine. Conceive On Air offers comfort and emotional support to women contemplating starting or expanding their family by consulting noted professional experts and by sharing the insights and experiences of others. Kim wants to share her experiences to educate and empower women. Conceive On Air is the only complete resource destination that inspires and informs future moms about their fertility on the journey to parenthood. 
Conceive On Air with Kim Hahn, celebrating the creation of families. Think of the world 50 years ago. Now think of this same world and how it'll be 50 years from now. Did you know that if the world's population continues to grow at its current rate, our children and grandchildren will only have 25% of the resources per capita that our parents and grandparents had? We must preserve the foundation of a quality standard of living. That foundation starts with Go Green Radio. Join your host, Jill Buck, for Go Green Radio every Friday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on Voice America. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in your brain inspired really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. I want to remind you that Crime Prevention, 1, Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes. You don't even have to be at your computer to listen to all this goodness. Now, let's meet Detective Michael Martinez. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101. Thank you, Susan. Now, Detective, for those that don't know what Crime Stoppers is, just give us a brief overview of, of it. Okay, well, what Crime Stoppers is, is it's a program where, um, um, which is actually international now, and um, basically the police department uses the public to help solve crimes. And so what we've done is there, there's an anonymous tip line that all Crime Stoppers programs have. Um, we feature um, different crimes and fugitives of the week um, where we're actively looking for somebody who's committed a crime. We're trying to identify somebody or we know somebody maybe that has a warrant, and what we do is ask the community if they, um, you know, if they know anything about the crime or if they know of the person um, who committed the crime or any information that they might have to give us a call. We uh, do not record our lines. We don't have caller ID, and they can call in and be completely anonymous. They're identified by a tip number that we give them, and if they're uh, the information that they give us, if it leads to an arrest of the person, then they're eligible for a reward. And that's really, really important because it's completely anonymous. So, you know, people, you, you may not, uh, you may be afraid of the person that you're going to turn in and worry about there being any repercussions, and there will absolutely not be any. Right. We don't. We don't. We never ask a person's name. We never ask anything about them. Um, as a matter of fact, when we actually record our tips, we are very careful. Um, how we word our tips to not even lean whether it's male or female, um, if it's a neighbor, because, you know, when people are giving information, a lot of times they'll tell us they're, you know, a neighbor or a family member or something, and we're very careful in our tips to, to not allude to who the person is or even, like I said, the sex of the person, um, anything about them um, that, you know, would even lead to know, um, maybe even narrow it down to who that person mm-hmm. is. So we're very careful with that, and we get a lot of people that will call in and, you know, we have to talk to them for a while. They say they have information, but they're, you know, real afraid and, you know, they don't want to, um, anybody to find out who they are. And um, very rarely do we have people that just say, you know, I can't do this. You know, that does happen sometimes. Mm-hmm. But usually um, just talking to them and reassuring them, you know, we'll never ask their name. Like I said, our lines are not recorded. We don't have caller ID in, or anything. And um, so you're you're very right. I mean, that's part of the, the whole success right. of Crime so Stoppers is that they are anonymous. Right. Now, the Albuquerque Crime Stoppers has a very special story. We do. Um, Back in, actually, in July of 1976, um, a young man, Michael Carmen, was actually um, shot and killed at a gas station he was working at. And um, Greg McLeese, who was a detective for the Albuquerque Police Department at the time, was working the case and was, you know, trying to find leads on the case, and, you know, he, in his mind, he was thinking, you know, somebody had to have saw something that night. Somebody had to have, you know, driven by or seen something that might be um, key for us in, in solving this case. So he um, 
reached out to one of our local um, TV stations here in town and, you know, talked to them and said, hey, I'd like to reenact this crime and, and put it on the, the TV and see if, you know, anybody might know of anything. Well, uh, you know, the, the um, TV stations, of course, were, were very willing to help out. And so they broadcast the reenactment of the, um, the shooting that occurred um, killing Michael Carmen. And um, that was about, I think it was like September of 1976, so a couple months later. And um, I think within 72 hours, um, they had the information it took to solve the murder of Michael Carmen. They had, um, I believe it was like two different tipsters call in with the information um, that ultimately led to the arrest of the offenders. So that was kind of the birth of Crime Stoppers. That was the first Crime Stoppers was Albuquerque Crime Stoppers, 1976. So that's 34 Correct. years old, if my math is right. Yes. And that was even before America's Most Wanted, my favorite I, show. Right, you right. Did, you did it first. Yeah, and so it's, um, you know, it's been a lot of change. Crime Stoppers is now international. I believe it's in more than, like, 18 countries. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, okay. you know, it's a huge success. It started there. Now, it we did. were going to give out uh, um, some information about uh, a case you, that you wanted some help with, but you actually caught that person. So let's just give out the tip line for those okay. in the Albuquerque area. Um, our number here in Albuquerque is 843-STOP or 843-7867. Um, we also have a website, w- website which is www.crimestoppersnm.org. And um, people are now able to text us tips as well. Um, if they text in APD to the, the, to the phone number 274-637, um, if they mm-hmm. just type in APD and plus a tip to us, we are also um, able now to receive texting tips, which is and, really great with, you know, the youth these days and nobody wants to talk on the phone, they want to text. So that's an awesome okay. new um, thing that... Um, our Crime Stoppers, and I believe the majority of Crime Stoppers are now using. Fantastic. Well, Detective Martinez, thank you so much for being with me today on Crime Prevention 101. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And you know what, my wonderful audience, that's a wrap for now. Please don't forget that we always love to hear from you. By all means, go to my host page at voiceamerica.com, post your comments and suggestions, tell your friends about us, Take a look at my CrimePrevention101.com blog. I've got links to my guests there and more information about the topics. And you and I will be doing this very same thing again next week when I'll have more stories that demand to be told, more hot crime topics, and, of course, lots of tips and resources for you. It would be a crime not to listen, so stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific at 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guest, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimeprevention101.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.